life. It's not there yet. Hello, everybody. A bit is just um, popped, popped out of the screen. I'll hopefully get them back in a few, few minutes, but uh, I can. I was talking about his books and his new new paper about death in the East, which is split between 1905 and 1922, and is the fourth in the Wyndham and Banerjee series. Hopefully. Claire Lang can get them back on in a couple of minutes. Um, I've, I've been reading little beers books right since the start. Uh, Rising Man was his first one. And he's recently been nominated for the Thieves and Scrap. Crown Book of the Year for his third one, Smoking Ashes. And the beer's back now. So Hi, I was I was always here. I could hear you and I could see you, but you couldn't see me. I was yeah. shouting away. How are you, Alex? I'm fine, thank you. Could you tell us a bit more about um Death in the East today? Sure. Um Death in the East, uh, for those of you who don't know, is the fourth in the Sam Wyndham and Surrender and Arth Banerjee series. Um, and it features my British detective, uh, Sam Wyndham, who goes to India after the First World War. Um, and there he sort of joins up with an Indian sergeant called Surendra Nath Banerjee. Um, and they essentially solve crimes. Um, but really what I'm also doing is I'm looking at the history of the British Raj, of the period of the British in India, um, but with a lot of dead bodies along the way. Now, uh, as I say, this is the fourth book in the series, um, and it sees um, Sam. Sam's got a wee bit of an opium problem, as you know, Alex. And uh, by the end of the third book, it gets to a point where he decides he can't go on like this. So he goes for rehab to an ashram in the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh, and that's where Death in the East starts. So he's on, on route to this ashram when he sees a ghost from his past, uh, a man who he thought was dead 30 years before. Uh, and that then takes us back to the east end of London and we see a bit of Sam's past. Um, the book started off as my tribute to Agatha Christie. Um, I always wanted to write a locked room mystery, you know, where you find a body in uh, locked in a room, murdered, uh, with no way in or out. Uh, how was the murder committed? How did the murderer escape? Um, and it just took me five books or five years to come up with an idea that I thought works and that nobody had done before. So that's how it started out. It, was, it started off as this locked room mystery um, set in East India. But um, as, as I wrote the book, um, I was more and more influenced by what was going on around us and the politics of, you know, immigration and integration and all of the fallout from the Brexit vote. Um, and I felt I needed to talk about my Britain, the Britain that I know and love uh, and the tolerant Britain that I know and love. Um, and to do that, I took Sam back into his past. Uh, back to 1905 uh, and his first case in the East End of London. So it's it's a wee bit it's a wee bit of a, a locked room mystery, but it's also um, no, it's also I think there's an allegory there for today's Britain. I love I love the split um, process of that book, and I think you said that you might do that again. I, I might do. I tell you what, though, it it took it out of me. It was the first time I've written in two timelines and. Um, it was so much more, uh, it, it required a lot more thought and a lot more effort. It's the first time I felt uh, comfortable doing that. I never felt up to it before, um, but it did. It took longer. It took six months longer than normal. And my, my editor was like, well, what's happening with this book? And I was like, I'm working on it. Um, the, the one I'm writing now, um, it's only one timeline, but for the first time, we are having more than one narrator. So all of the first four books are narrated by Sam. Uh, but in book five, um, Sam won't be the only narrator. Fascinated by that, because it'll come across really good on audio. Yeah. 
Well, I hope so. I'm, I'm wondering how he's, how he's going to play that. Um, the, the books are narrated by a guy called Simon Bubb. Um, so he's going to have his work cut out for him with, <laughs> in the next one. I, I, re um, I really do like your themes and Smoke and Ashes was a really um, complicated one because you were bringing in uh, the, um, the non-violence movement. That's right. Um, Smoke and Ashes, um, which is currently uh, long-listed for the Feakstons, so if anybody liked the book, please do vote for it. Um, I really enjoyed writing Smoke and Ashes. I think out of the ones that I've written, um, that's probably the one that I think of most of as a thriller. So that's actually set in 1921, and um, basically Sam thinks there's a serial killer at loose in Calcutta, uh, but he can't really tell anybody about it because the, the crime he witnessed took place in an opium den where he shouldn't really have been. Um, and so when he goes back, there's no body there. So he, he's he's not sure if he, he dreamt it or not, but but also he can't really tell anyone. Um, but the book quickly becomes, you know, it's more than just uh, a deranged serial killer. There's actually a much deeper text going on. And part of that uh, is based on, the, you know, the start of the freedom struggle. So you have 1921, was the year that um, Gandhi said to the Indians, if you give me non-violent, non-cooperation, I will give you independence by the end of the year. And so millions and millions of people came out on strike. It was a bit, I think, like the miners' strike of the 80s, but on, you're, you're much too young to remember that, but I remember the miners' mm -hmm. strike. And it was, you know, this, this great battle between the state and the people. Um, and there was so much hardship and, and in the midst of that, in the midst of that, the British government decided to send the Prince of Wales, uh, who was later uh, King Edward, who married uh, seventh, was it, or King Edward VIII? I can't remember. The one who married Mrs. Simpson. So yeah. they sent him to India in the middle of that, thinking this is a good idea. Everybody's up in arms. Let's send the Prince of Wales. Uh, and so he arrives in Bombay, and there's this huge riot going on because he's there. And the poor guy didn't want to be there. He hated Indians. <laughs> he just wanted to go home, and he just wanted to play golf. Um, so he spent the next two months going around India, essentially shooting things, animals mainly, but, you know, going on safari and stuff. And so he turns up in Calcutta on Christmas Day, um, <laughs> which is great timing. It was great timing for me because you can't make all this up. So I have this serial killer running around, whom Sam and Surrender are not trying to find. At the same time, the Prince of Wales is arriving and nobody wants him there. Um, and really, I mean, there's also a deeper message to the book. Um, and it's it's around crimes committed by the, the British military, uh, military scientists, um, which they later went on to do against British soldiers and Australian soldiers. But they did, they did um, you know, they carried out some crimes against Indian soldiers first. Um, so really, I wanted to highlight all of that, but in a package that was a real thriller. So I'm talking too much, Alex. You need to you need to talk more. Yeah, that's fine. I was just uh, interested in that because, of course, with that, I mean that people will know a lot more about it and will be able to decide whether to put it on the feet. And so that's why I was like, I hope so, yes. <laughs> um, um, your, your period that you chose, why, why was it the 20s that you chose for the period? I, I chose the twenties, I think, because well, it, it starts off immediately after the First World War, so we're starting off in the the end of nineteen nineteen, and and really, what I wanted to do was look at the period between the end of the First World War and the end of Empire, which was nineteen forty seven, um, really, because I think that was the era um, when I think things started to change. I think the moral ascendancy that the British had had gone. And I think the will to control India, after so much blood had been shed um, in Europe, I think the will to control such a big empire was on the way out. And it was also, I think, the first time that people questioned what their superiors and their betters told them. You know, so many of the finest uh, of British youth died on the battlefields of France uh, and around the world, led by, you know, complete idiots from the aristocracy. Uh, you might think there are parallels today, but but that was the that was the beginning of of this. You know, we're we're not 
we're no longer just going to count out. Individuals will start thinking about what's right and what's wrong and not just defer to their, their betters. Um, and Sam very much falls into that category. Sam is a, a man who he's scarred by his wartime experiences but that means he no, he no longer accepts what he's told he's not he doesn't blindly follow his superior's orders he actually looks at things for himself and he makes his own decisions um and so he he holds up a mirror both to british society in india but also he's looking at it i hope from a fresh perspective he's not just accepting what his superiors tell him um and i needed that and i think that started in 1919 um, doing it before the war would have been a tougher challenge. Yeah. Over the um, period until 47, do you, you think you'll end up doing a spin-off with Banerjee or or you think you'll do both of them in one book? That is a very good question. I did say to myself last year that I was going to write a Christmas, um, just a wee uh, short story entitled uh, Banerjee's Christmas or Surrender Not's Christmas. Um, but I never got around to it because I was just too slow and too lazy um I, I, should be lazy. I just i didn't get around to it but yeah i was lazy as well um i will do, i mean i i'm really considering what i do with banerji because as i said um this is the first time i'm writing book five now uh, he's really coming to his own if you look at his progression between books one and four you'll see that he's developed as an individual he's developed as a character but he's also much more willing to stand his ground um, and you'll see more of that in book five. So as I say, book five, first time we're going to hear another voice other than Sam's narrating. Um, and that is Surin, who will be narrating half of the book as well, from his point of view. Um, the big question I have right now is what happens right at the end? Because I'm almost finished. I've almost finished the first draft. Um, my question, and I think I know what's going to happen. Um, my question is really around what, what happens with Surin. Where does he go? Where does Banerjee go at the end of this? It's um, really interesting to see the, the arc of characters. Um, it, are there any other minor characters that you think you might use later on? Um, yeah. Annie, who I don't think is a minor character, there's a, there's a, a lady called Annie Grant, who um, I think Sam has a thing for um he's not quite sure what it is and you know he's he's a widower um and he's he's english so he's not quite sure how to deal with ladies anyway um and so you know he has his his view towards annie is that he's not sure if he wants to be with her but he'll be damned if anybody else will be allowed to be with her so he, he carries out this sort of low-level guerrilla campaign against her love life um and i think I want to do a book with her. I need I need to do a book where she is um, front and centre. I mean, she does. She plays a role in book five, uh, but it's a supporting role. Um, I really need to. It's about. I want to see the what happens in the relationship with Sam and Annie uh, because I think that'll be fascinating. It'll be fascinating to Sam as much as anything else. That scene last week was talking about the fifties mm -hmm. uh, in India. Um, do you think you might? do after 47 or um i don't think i'm i'm not gonna i don't think i will look at india after 47 um i'm currently thinking of putting you know after book five taking a wee bit of a breather from the series uh and i'm thinking of writing and i will be writing um um something which is completely up to date so it'll be a modern day thriller um and it will be set here and in america so it'll be completely different um to what I, what i've written before what i will say is that it's got i mean whenever i write something there has to be an angle that i think i can add um as a, a british asian or an ethnic minority there must be an angle to a story that i can tell that most other writers wouldn't be able to tell otherwise there's no point in me writing it there are you know phenomenal other writers out there who can write wonderful thrillers uh, unless I'm bringing something that they can't do, just in terms of outlook, um, then, you know, why am I writing it? It's, it it's, there's got to be a reason for me to write a book. It's got to be something that I feel ha hasn't been explored or hasn't been looked at from a particular angle. Um, and so that's what I want to write in this book. The book I want to write next is going to be about radicalization and it's going to be a thriller and it's going to be based in the UK and America. Um, but it's going to deal with, 
you know, people from different backgrounds and from a viewpoint that maybe other um, writers wouldn't feel comfortable tackling. So east east of Hounslow, Aston. <laughs> well, um, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be far west of Hounslow this one, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, this is going to be far to the west, but it's it's um, it's not going to be dealing with Asian communities as such. So yes and no, but it's definitely going to be something modern, and it's going to be something. In fact, most of it's going to be set in America. To be honest with you, um, it's going to start here, but it's going to go over there very very quickly. <laughs> In an earlier interview, I heard you talking with another author about their book, Take It Back. Um, do you think there's a growing um, group of authors that are going to cover that area of Britain? I would hope that there would be. Um, I can't tell you that... Um, I can't say for sure. I mean, it depends what people publish. At the end of the day, you know, books like that, let like Take It Back, uh, which for those of you who haven't read it, it's set in the Bangladeshi community or the, the, the uh, sort of, a, it's a Muslim community uh, and it involves rape of a girl. Um, it's, it's a very, very difficult subject to write about. So firstly, I think there's a there's a problem in terms of, how easy it is to tell those stories. So, I mean, I, I really admire Kia for, for writing uh, about such a difficult subject. Um, I'm sure she's come under pressure not to write about something so visceral, um, but she's done it and fair credit, fair dues to her. Um, the next question is whether or not books like that get published. Um, five years ago, what I write, what Vasim writes, what Kia writes may not have been published or 10 years ago simply because people might not have thought there was a market for it. Um, if people think there's a market for it and there is, I would love to see more books like that published because I think, you know, there, there have been tendencies to, to sweep certain things under the carp and, and, you know, immigrant communities have this, you know, there, there are issues which aren't aired. And I think they need to be aired. So I don't think there should be any subjects that are taboo or off limits. Um, and I don't think people should be scared about writing uh, them. At the same time, it needs to be done in a way that can't be used um, by people with an, an agenda against ethnic minorities. You know, it can't be used as a, it shouldn't be used as a weapon. Um, so that it's a very, very tough line to tread. But I would love to see more books like that. Red Hot Chili Writers has done a really good job of trying to hi highlight that. Um, just a side question as well. How's your mum doing with lockdown and things? Because obviously well, she's a bit stir crazy, Mum. I should, <laughs> should point out for those of you who haven't heard the podcast. So um, Vasim Khan and I and some of our friends run a podcast called the Red Hot Chili Writers podcast. Um, and we used to do it from my mum's kitchen. Uh, because that was like the most convenient location between me and Vasim. Um, but very quickly, mum became the star of it. Nobody really wanted to listen to me or Vasim. They wanted to just to listen to mum, which was great. I mean, we loved it and she she got into it. Um, but then then she went away. She, she goes to India for Christmas. She goes away. She's like, she's like the birds. She flies south for the winter. Um, and she came back in February. Um, but we haven't been able to see her since because of lockdown. Um, and she's really missing everybody. She's she's missing the podcast. She's missing her friends. Um, so I mean, and she's at, she's in that high risk category of being you know over seventy and being an ethnic minority because the virus appears to be racist as well, uh, which is great news. Um, and um, yeah, so I think she's feeling a wee bit stir crazy. She's well. She's keeping well, but I think she wants to get out as soon as possible. Yeah. People are asking what the bottles are behind me. That is whiskey. That is that is very much whiskey. Um, and I should say that's only part of the collection. So, um, you know, I know I know most people have books behind them, but I have my priorities right. <laughs> As, um... Oh, somebody's phoning me. Mum's actually phoning. I can't really talk to mum now. Um, so <laughs> she's actually phoning me. Right? I can't talk to her. Gosh, that's 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 the issue with live broadcasts. Eh? It's all right. Just text her and tell her you're on. It's fine. Well, I'll, I'll tell her later. If she phones again, I'll tell her, and then we'll, I'll yeah. call her.
hopefully, hopefully we won't need to do that. But carry on. Uh, I was just wondering. Um, can you still see me? Because I've gone blank on your screen. I can still see you. Yeah. Cool. Cool. That's fine. I, you can see me. everybody else in the world can still see you as well. Because yeah. Fingers um, crossed. Um, I was mainly really curious about how um, when you first started it, um, your series, how the publicity helped you out. Because of course, with the second book, there was the Zoe Ball Award. And I was I was very lucky. I'll be honest with you. Um, I came to writing late. Um, I, I it sort of started as a wee bit of a midlife crisis. I'd I'd always wanted to write. Um, but I never had the courage. I never thought I was good enough. Um, and I spent most of my life being an accountant, which is, you know, it's quite, I was a writer trapped in the body of an accountant and it was quite surreal. Um, and then at the age of 39 and three quarters, I had a bit of a midlife crisis and I thought, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life if I could, if I don't have to. Um, and I had this idea for this British detective who goes to India. Um, and I started writing it, but it probably wouldn't have gone anywhere. I, I wrote a few thousand words and then I read it and then I thought, oh my gosh, this is awful. And I stuck it in a drawer. Um, and then I was very lucky. I saw this competition in the Telegraph looking for new writers and all they wanted was the first 5,000 words of a novel uh, and a two page synopsis of the rest. And I was lucky because I had 10,000 rotten words in a drawer. So I took out the first 5,000 and sent it, tidied it up and sent it away. And I, I was lucky I won. Um, and, and that became my first novel, A Rising Man. Um, and there was a lot of publicity around it because it was a debut, because I'd you know, come through this competition. But also it was quite different. I think I was very lucky in that nobody was writing crime fiction in India in that period. And so it was quite fresh. And so there was a lot, I mean, it was it was a Times Book of the Month. It was Sunday Times picked it as a book of the month. Uh, Waterstones chose it as their thriller of the month. So there was a lot of that. Um, and I didn't realise how lucky I was at the time. I just thought, oh, this is what happens with every book. Um, but it's not. I think, I think debuts get a bit of love. Um, and I, I got a lot of love because I think that, you know, the stars just aligned for me. Um, but it's when you come up when when your second book comes out that you realise you don't get that publicity normally, um, and so the second book came out to you know much less fanfare. There was a lot of there was there was press, but it wasn't you know the, there wasn't the same marketing that had gone into the first. Um, I was very lucky that the second book got picked up by um, the Zoe Ball Book Club, uh, and that really helped push it forward. Um, and also that went on to win the Wilbur Smith Award for adventure writing. I didn't even know I wrote adventure fiction, but it turns out I do. Um, and, and that really helped as well. Um, so I was very, very lucky um, in a way that a lot of people maybe maybe don't get that luck. Um, you know, from the beginning of my career, you know, I, as I say, I'd, I'd not written thousands and t I've ne not written hundreds of thousands of words or sent away manuscripts or whatever. I, I basically got very very lucky um and and you know the rest is history i can see some of these questions coming up i'm just going to answer a couple of those alex and then yeah. we'll get back to this. Yeah. first yeah. thing no there is not a single bottle of bourbon on my shelf shame on you whoever whoever's asking that question there's no there's no bourbon up there uh in terms of my this has turned into whiskey hour hasn't it um in terms of my favorite whiskey there's quite a few right now I'm very partial to a Glen Farkless um, 25, and I've been very lucky in that. Um, I got two bottles, one from a birthday and one from a Christmas, just from friends. Um, and so I had, I had I'd run out, and now I've got two bottles of that up there. So I'm very lucky in that respect. Um, am I still an accountant? I'm, I'm an accountant at heart still, um, but I have given up the day job uh, technically. Um, I went part time at first, uh, and I told my colleagues this. And they were like, didn't you go part-time years ago? Um, and the final question up there right now, did you always foresee a series when you wrote the first? Yes, I did. I always knew it was going to be a series um, because, as I say, I wanted to look at that period between you know 1919 and 1947. What I would say is when I started out, I thought I'd be writing a book a year 
all the way from sort of 1919. Uh, but that's about 30 years. <laughs> I'll probably be dead long before I get a chance to finish it. So I'll probably have to sort of skip a few years uh, now and then. Um, so, and somebody just said Bushmills is very nice. Yes, Bushmills is nice, but it's not a single malt. It's not a Scotch single malt, is it? Let's let's be honest. <laughs> We're going to get into an argument here with, <laughs> with people. I was just wondering in in that um, how are you going to deal with um, the characters aging? Because I know that um, Ian Franklin has uh, given uh, Reeve the COPD and things like that. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, a fantastic, you know, malady for a detective to have, isn't it? COPD is brilliant. You can't. Um, my characters are going to age. They're going to age in real time. So as, um, you know, as every year passes, they get a year older. Um, so it's not as if they are going to stay wedded in time. They are going to move forward. I think what we will see is there's going to be some schism between the two central characters, between Sam and Surin at some point. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, uh, but there will be a reconciliation. There always is. Um, and if I do make it to 47, I would like to see Surendranath being the first Indian chief of police for, for either Bengal or for India. I haven't decided yet, but I think that's where I want to go. Um, but we'll see. Are there any periods in the, periods in the art that you really want to cover? Yeah, I mean, there's. I started writing with this anger uh, about an event in 1942-43, which um, I feel like I'm talking about a lot, but not many people still know about it, which is the Bengal famine, um, uh, which took place um, around Calcutta. So Calcutta is um, the, the, the capital of the province of Bengal. Now, Bengal is a, an area the size of France. It's a big place. Um, and during the war, the Japanese got to the you know the edges of Bengal, the the, the eastern extremities. At which point, uh, the British government and Churchill diverted all the food supplies and all of the, the riverine transport. So, excuse me, just a sec, my wee boys come in. <laughs> I'm on the, I'm on the, do you want to wave to people? Come here and wave. All right, come, come, come here, and come wave. Yeah. Say hello to everybody. Say, say hi. 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 We lost a tooth yesterday, didn't we? See, tooth. So, um, so yeah, and so in. All right, can, I, can you go upstairs, Baba? Cheers. And so, um, three million, two to three million people starved to death in what was a man-made famine um, that could have been prevented, but and a lot of the blame lies at Churchill's door. Uh, and my father was, you know, he was a young boy at the time, and he remembers skeletons, you know walking skeletons just coming into Calcutta and dying on the streets. Um, and this is something that, you know, we, we hear about the Holocaust and we hear about all of the tragedies in Europe, but we as a country, we don't talk about this man-made Holocaust, this famine that took place, um, a lot of which the, the blame lies at Churchill's door and we don't discuss it. Um, and I really wanted to draw attention to that because, and, and this is where the anger comes in, I wrote about it in, a, in an essay for my English class when I was 15, um, and I expected to get an A for it, and I got a C. Um, and I've always been harboring a grudge ever since that then, because my teachers hadn't heard about it. Um, and so, yeah, my, my life's ambition is to, is to publicise this event that took place on our watch, because I think we in Britain tend to have this feeling that we are we're always on the side of the angels we tend to be on the side of right and good but we haven't been our history does not bear that out we just tend not to look at our history um so that is a story i really want to tell um while is, keeping my son out of the room <laughs> <laughs> um are there any of you like um teachers back at school that you like um because obviously if they didn't um uh just like that essay it might might have um got you in a different angle because you never know what's gonna Do you know what you could be right i'm st i'm still in touch with that teacher um he was a phenomenal english teacher he's a, a man called mr simon um one of the best teachers I ever had. I was very lucky to have him. Um, 
uh, but you know, and I've told him this story, and he's he gets a, a mention in the acknowledgements at the end of the first book, actually. Um, but yeah, you, that's a very good question. I, I don't know if I would have written about this if I hadn't had that sort of anger within me since that sort of age. Um, the funny thing is, nowadays, you know, since I've become a writer, I get invited back to school to do prize givings and stuff like that, which is great. <laughs> Beforehand, when I was an accountant, nobody wanted to know me. <laughs> Uh, you see, um, like, like, to, like to do events, is there anywhere in the world that you've not been that you, you would want to go after lockdown? So after? many, so many places. I've, I've been very fortunate. I've been to a lot of places. Um, you know, through writing, I've been to places I never dreamt I would go. I've been in um, Kiev, in the Ukraine. I've been, you know, all around Europe, uh, been to a couple of trips to America. I would love to go to New Zealand uh, and Australia. Um, and I got asked to go down to New Zealand, um, but it just wouldn't work sort of logistically at the moment. Um, I'd love to go to South America. That'd be brilliant as well. Um, and Japan. So I'd love to, I mean, there's so much though. I just want to use writing as an excuse to go to all these places, hopefully on, you know, paid trips. Um, but I've been very lucky. I mean, India especially, I've done several times um, with the book. Last time I went with uh, Val McDermott and Graham McRae Burnett. Um, and that was, a, that was a really special trip. I really enjoyed that. Um, principally because I could just make up stuff and pass it off as fact to two brilliant writers. Uh, but yeah, yeah, this, this, this is all historical. They, they, they would believe everything I said, which was great. <laughs> I was going to ask you about your relationship with Val because it's uh, it's a really uh, nice one because you do I think you call it anti Val, don't you? I think that's right. Yeah. It's my anti Val. Um, I must say I owe so much to Val. Um, you know when when the first book came out, um, she had me on her New Blood panel at Harrogate's, um, which is you know, such an honour. She reads every debut novel in the crime field that comes out, and she chooses four authors to be on her panel at Harrogate. And for a debut author, they, they, there's no greater start to your career when you have a room full of 1,500 people listening to you and Val's recommendation. Um, so I was a wee bit starstruck when I met her for the first time at Harrogate. And um, I sort of said to her, oh, you must come round for dinner. I, I don't know what was going through my head. I was just like, you know, just speaking at this point. And she said, yes. So I said to my wife, you've got Val McDermott coming for dinner. And my wife said, well, I'm not sure I'm, I'm good enough cook for that. So we thought, oh, I'll tell you what, let's get around to mum's house. Uh, and mum can cook for her. So we invited her around to mum's and, and she did. Mum was up in Scotland at the time. Uh, so, so, But what mum didn't tell us is that she was going to Blackpool that day. So she went off and coached her. She, she did all the cooking, right, the day before. Then she got up in the morning and went to Blackpool on a coach trip. Came back an hour before Val turns up, wearing a crispy quick hat and a sari, and <laughs> just did the rest of the cooking, and it was brilliant. Um, it was very good. And and since then, you know, I've, I can't tell you what the friendship and the support of somebody like, you know, Val McDermott means to me. Um, at the same time, I, I mean, you've found this. You've seen just how nice and generous all of the great sort of crime writers are. You know, Ian Rankin, Mark Billingham, Lee Child, Denise Miner. They're all such wonderful people. They're people that don't need to give me the time of day, but they go out of their way to, um, you know, be helpful and, and help writers who are starting out in their careers. You can't ask for more than that. Much better than romantic fiction authors. You heard about them. Gosh, they'd scratch your eyes out if they thought you were competition. It's not like that with crime writers, is it? We we get all our anger out on the page. We're the loveliest people. <laughs> it's easy for me to say, I suppose. <laughs> What's it like being a judge now as well? Now you've um, moved on to that. Well, yeah, I've been judging um, the the McKittrick Prize for a couple of years now, and I was also a judge on the Wilbur Smith Award um, last year. Um, not the year I won, that would be, that would be cheating. <laughs> it was the year after. Um, no, um, so I've, I've been very lucky. Um, the McKittrick Prize is a Society of Authors Award for the best debut by uh, a writer over 40. And they thought, you're an old man, why don't you judge this? Um, 
which is great, but it, it, it gives me, um, it's given me so much um, variety to read. So I, I normally, I mean, I've been doing it for three years. I think this will be my last year, the one I've just done. Um, yeah. But you, we get something like 60 books to read. Uh, they arrive in November, December. Uh, we get that down to a short list um, by March, April. Um, and it's great. Um, it, it's, it's the interesting bit is the discussions that you have because it's not just a crime writing award. It's it's for all kinds of fiction. And so the question is, well, how do you judge, let's call it a crime fiction debut against a literary fiction debut? Um, I even have to read romantic fiction. And sometimes it'll open my eyes. There'll be things that I've read that I thought, oh, this is going to be terrible. I'm going to hate reading this. And I've loved it. And I find myself crying at the end of some books. Uh, it was dust, it was dust. Um, but yeah, it's been a great experience. Um, um, yeah, I, I, it, what it does do is it takes a lot of time though. So I think I'm going to take a rest from the judging for the next year or so, just because I want to catch up on my own reading. Um, but also I need, if I'm writing this new book, I think I'm going to need, I'm going to need to think about it in different ways. Mm. On the subject of interviews, I know that you've interviewed a lot of people. I'm not actually right. Is there anyone you've not interviewed yet that you want to? Loads of people. Um, we are going to have Auntie Val on. She's told me she'll come on. I just need to get my, uh, you know, my my arse and gear and get her booked. And uh, I want so many. I want Lee Child on. I'd love to have Ian Rankin on. Um, but also, I want I want people that aren't writers. Um, the idea of uh, the Red Hot Chili Writers was to look at arts and culture, but from a British Asian point of view. Um, and the arts and culture is, is broader than just crime fiction. It just so happens that most people we have on tend to be authors and mainly crime writers because those are our friends. But I would like to have, uh, um, I'd like to have more people from the arts. I'd like to have more people from the media on. Um, and I'd like a spread of guests. Right now, most of our guests are white. Uh, I would like to have more ethnic minority guests on. And we've had a few, but I'd like to have more on because I think anything that adds to the discussion and deepens the understanding that you know normal white people have of ethnic minorities um, is beneficial because you'll just see that we are just the same as anybody else. If anything, we are slightly more boring, uh, but we have hotter food, that's it. But we're all still British and I want to bring that out. And I want, I want that dialogue um, because I think it's important. I mean, we've done an episode on you know ethnic minorities in publishing and the publishing of ethnic minority books and that probably got more traction than, than most of our um, podcasts simply because it's such a hot topic and you don't normally hear the sort of views that, that we put forward um, I want I want to have more sort of I'd love to have some people on from the media I'd love to have um, some of these news readers that we have, people like Ria Chatterjee, Michelle Hussein, I would love guests like that as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I want a mix, and I want I want to interview more people. In in the Zoe Ball um, interviews, um, you were on the sofa with the um, goodness gracious me people. With Mir Sayal. Well, I, I wasn't allowed on the sofa. <laughs> I just say that I wasn't famous enough, but I was recorded. Um, uh, as being with them, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think in uh, other events I've seen you at, you said that they were an influence on you as a kid, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I grew up, what, in the, the 80s and 90s, um, when the only time you saw a brown face on TV was probably blacked up or browned up, uh, or on something like Mind Your Language. I don't know if you remember that. It's <laughs> just a terrible <laughs> But my parents loved it, and they loved it, and so many Asians loved it, because it was the only time you saw an Asian face on TV. And it's very hard to to explain to people who who are used to seeing people like them in the media just what a difference it makes when you don't have role models that look like you, when you don't see people that look like you, when you don't see people who've had the same experiences as you. Um, and then suddenly, goodness gracious me, came on and it was on firstly on the radio. I remember when it was on Radio 4 and it was it was like nothing I'd listened to before. It was something that spoke to me because the experiences that they were talking about and laughing about were the experiences of people who were growing up like me, British Asians growing up in this society. And, and what it showed a lot of people um, was that, you know what, 
it was accessible. You know, the, 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 the people that listened to it were mainly white. And it showed that our humor still translated. It had a deeper meaning for me because it showed me people that looked like me and had my experiences. Um, and it's very, very hard to explain that because unless you've been through it, unless you've gone through a life where you see other people on screen and suddenly people that look like you are making jokes about your daily life and people that you can relate to. So you'll have a figure there. There was like a character that thought, you know, everything was made in India. You know, Father Christmas, <laughs> big beard, dodgy suit, Indian. You know, and it was that sort of thing because we all had uncles that thought like that. Oh yeah, all the good things come from India, and you, you could laugh at that, and you and it made such a difference to me. Um, since then, I don't think we've had that much, but there's a great series on right now on Netflix called Never Have I Ever, which I think Mindy Calling is the producer of, and that does a very similar thing. You've got a young. American, American uh, Indian American, not American Indian, Indian American girl, uh, and her family in in sort of near in California, and her growing up, and that to me, you know, I still watch that, and I find it very funny, and I find it, I find myself calling my sister and saying, you should watch this because there's so much that we can relate to from our childhood in in these sorts of programs. Um, when have, you I that? have you watched Never Have I Ever? I haven't now, unfortunately. Oh, you've got to watch it. You've got to watch I've it. Got to, I've got to give it a look. I do like. I do like a good laugh. Yeah. Um, as you were talking about the modern um, family things, uh, um, will that come into the uh, American one that you're looking at, or? There will be. There will be a part of that. Um, I, I don't want to say too much about it, but yeah, um, th there will definitely be a family angle to it because I, I want to look at the impacts of, um, of radicalization on families because we never talk about that. We talk about terrorists and we talk about um, the victims. We don't talk about, well, what's the impact on the families of people that are radicalized? Um, and I'm really interested in that. You know, how what if you what happens if your son or your daughter suddenly joins a cult or becomes a terrorist? What what does that do to the family? And 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 that's what I want to explore because I don't think it has been done that much. Um, and I want to show that you know there are different forms of radicalization, but they then tend to have the same root causes. So maybe we should treat them the same way, or at least tackle them the same way. Really, um, really uh, interesting. Now, getting back to the Sam Wyndham and the second book, um, it covers the Raj and things. I mean, what was unique about that that made you want to cover that? Well, the, the second book in the series, um, A Necessary Evil, um, looks at the, the princely states, the, the Maharajas. Um, so even when India was, um, you know, ruled by the British, two fifths of it. Was still nominally independent and it was ruled by these maharajas who were you know the richest men in the world they were like the saudi sheikhs today you know they had so much money they had no power but they were de descended from warriors but they had no power um but they had loads of money so they, they led this really weird lifestyle so they had huge palaces and in india they would have you know many wives and concubines and princesses and in india they would marry you know the, the highest caste princesses and then they would come to London and fall in love with um, a trapeze artist or a chiropodist assistant and marry them and take them back as their 20th wife to this palace in the middle of nowhere. And they would, you know, they'd fill up their swing pools with Dom Perignon champagne to, to toast, you know, the, the birth of a child. As long as it was a boy, you know, you wouldn't do that if it was a girl. Um, but they were really bizarre men. And I wanted to look at that period in history. I, want, I wanted to see the world of the Maharajas. But as I did my research, I, I realized that the really interesting story was, was the women, the Maharanis and the princesses and the concubines. You know, these were people that we thought of as, you know, sort of downtrodden and forgotten by history. But when you did the research, I found that so many of them were really quite powerful in their own right. Um, you know, they used to stay in what we call the harem, and it was just cut off from all men other than thing. Um, and so people sort of saw it as this sort of sexual pleasure dome, but what it actually often was, was a source, a center of political power for women where men couldn't get at them. So a lot of the time you had these princesses that were, you know, ph phenomenal businesswomen in their own right, um, who made lots of money. 
And on other occasions, you had these princesses who actually ran the kingdoms. Um, the, the Maharaja would be off, you know, in London or Paris gallivanting. And it was the women that drove education and welfare and culture and really kept the, these, you know, kept these kept progress going in these states. And that had been written out of history to a large extent. So that's really why I wanted to look at that in the second book. Um, is there anything that um, anybody out in the audience wants to ask? There's, um, some, there's some lovely questions here that I need to, I haven't read. Shall I get down to them? Hold on, let's see. Yeah. Um, I've been told, uh, we don't talk about the contribution made by Indian soldiers in the, in the wars either. And that's very true. I mean, um, I think over a million served on the side of the British in the First World War. Even Gandhi, I think, you know, volunteered to be a stretcher bearer in the First World War on the side of the British. Um, what's really interesting is the Second World War, where um, Indians fought on both sides. Um, the, there was the, you know, the Indians that fought for the Allies, but there was also um, Indians who fought um, under what was known as the Indian National Army, which was uh, allied to the Japanese. Um, and at the end of the war, the British tried to put three of the highest ranking officers on trial. Um, and they were all found guilty, but public opinion wouldn't let the British, you know, um, execute them. And what's really odd, or what may be surprising to your viewers, is that to this day, the soldiers and the widows of the soldiers who fought for the British don't get any pension from the Indian government, but those that fought against the British, you know, with the Japanese, still receive a pension from the Indian government because they were seen as freedom fighters. Um, and what that shows you is that there's always two sides to every story, uh, one that we may not think. So we, we always think that we are on the side of right, uh, whereas other people may disagree. Um, and that to me is a very interesting story. Let's have a look. There's another question. We need your mom to come and do a live chat with us. She <laughs> <love that. laughs> I'll speak to her and see what we can do there. Oh, this is a good question here. What have been your favourite recent reads? Um, it's quite a few. I'm reading right now. I'm reading um, The Curator by uh, M.W. Craven, which comes out next week. Uh, I was lucky to get a preview copy. Um, M.W. Craven, Mike Craven, won the CWA Gold Dagger last year. Uh, phenomenal writer. His books are set uh, generally up in Cumbria, where he lives. Um, I'm sure you've you've interviewed him. Um, yes, yeah, we'll is be the, in the future, I'm sure. Uh, well, and he's a lovely guy. And this is the latest in the Tilly and Poe series. Um, and there is a it's a serial killer who's just leaving body parts around Cumbria with weird messages attached. Um, and it's a, it's a great read. So I'm reading that at the moment. Um, what else have I read recently? Uh, a book called Diary of a Somebody. Have you read that by Brian Bilston? It's not a crime novel. It's just, it's, um, Brian Bilston is a, a Twitter poet. I don't know if you've come across him, but he's got like millions of followers on Twitter. Uh, and he's written this book about a character called Brian, who uh, decides he's going to write a poem a day for a year. And he's a, a widow, he's not a widow, he's a, he's a divorcee and he's sort of middle-aged and he's not much going for him and he fancies this woman called Liz down at the Poetry Club. Um, and it's just a very, very funny book. The question is, is he going to win Liz's affections or will his arch nemesis Toby Salt, who's got far more Twitter followers than him and has had poems published, is he going to win her heart? So that's a great book as well. It's, it's a very funny book. So I'd recommend that if you want something that's not crimey. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think of um, something else. Um, is um, is there anything um, that you've um, read recently that you think that other people won't have looked for because obviously there's been a crime one and then you just mentioned one mm -hmm. and there's another great book um leonard and hungry paul i don't know if any of your readers have read that that's a bit different as well I've, i think in lockdown i've been looking for books that cheer me up um and leonard and hungry paul's written by an irish writer called ronan hessian 
And it's about these two friends who basically don't do very much. Um, but they're the quiet people. They're, they're, they're good friends. They play board games. They try and put the world to rights. Um, and it's just a lovely, endearing book. Uh, so I'd very much recommend that as well. Um, there's a question coming from Samantha Brownlee here. Has your research thrown up any surprising things? Loads of stuff. I mean, the, the great thing about research is um, you never know what you're going to find. It always, I mean, I'm a nerd. And I think when you write historical fiction of any type, kind, I think you've got to have a love for the research. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Um, but so much has been, I mean, I the story I tell is, is I always have trouble keeping stuff out. So I once ended up researching the, the Calcutta sewer system um, for about a day. And then I felt, given that I know so much about it, the readers needed to know so much about it. So I put it all in, in the first draft of the novel. And my editor quite rightly said, no one needs to know about the Calcutta <laughs> sewer system. Just take it out. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there's, there's stuff, there's, there's research that you can do online and there's research that I think you need to do on the ground. Um, it's, it's absolutely possible to write a book without being on the ground, um, but I think it, it definitely helps. It tends to be the things I don't expect that I find out when I'm doing research on the ground. So um, the examples, there's always a couple of examples that stick out. And for me, the main one is the colour of the police uniforms in Calcutta. So in all of India, um, or most of India, the uniforms are khaki and have always been khaki. And I've watched so many Bollywood films that I naturally assumed that the uniforms of the police would be khaki. But in Calcutta, um, they're not. And they've never been khaki. They've always been white. Um, and that came as a wee bit of a shock. And I wouldn't have realised it had I not been there and had I not seen it. Um, and the second thing is I, I assumed that you know, the colour of the, the earth or the, the soil in Calcutta would be red because it's red in most of northern, northern India. But Calcutta sits in the Ganges Delta, so you get all of this silt that comes down from, you know, halfway across India and lands in Bengal. And so the earth is actually black. And that was, a, that was again, something that I would have missed if I hadn't actually been there. Um, in terms of interesting stuff, um, there's a wee street in Calcutta called Fancy Street, and it's not fancy at all. It's horrible. And I was, I was there, I was on a walking tour, and I asked the guide, why is this called Fancy Street? And he goes, ah, it's, it's, a, it's actually um, a mispronunciation of a Bengali word. The word is fashi, which means hanging. So it was the road that they hanged people on, and the Bengali word fashi became fancy in English. <laughs> so these people were hanged on Fancy Street. Um, here we go. Here's another question. Are you trying to plan any book events in anticipation of any further easing up of lockdown? Um, yes and no. I'm not really doing very much. I'm, the, the paperback of book four, Death in the East, the launch of that has been postponed to August. Um, I'm not planning on, I mean, I've, I'm, when I'm asked to do things, I do things. So I think there's going to be a few more of these sorts of things that I will do. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not doing too much myself in terms of planning these things, simply because I'm writing the end of book five and I'm also planning this standalone novel. Um, so I don't really have time to look at these, but I, if, if anybody asks me, I generally say yes, uh, because it's not very difficult to get to right now. I'll just sit here and, and do it. So yes, that, um, there's another question come up. How many places are invented and how many have you spent time in? That's a good question. Um, well, in the second book, I, I t um, the second book, there's a, a place called Sambalpur, which is the kingdom in which um, the book is set. That's a real place, and it was uh, it was a real kingdom, but it wasn't at the time I set the book. It was part of the British Empire. It wasn't independent at that point, but uh, I just changed that because I needed a royal family there. Um, for the fourth book, this one, Death in the East, the, the village where it's all set is real, uh, there is a, a village called Jatinga in Assam, and uh, birds do do strange things there. It's it's a very strange part of the world. Um, legend has that it's haunted, but nobody quite knows. There's a, there's a specific effect that takes place on one or two nights a year, and I'm not going to spoil it for you, um, but nobody knows quite why that happens, uh, and I thought that's a great location. So the, so the, I've not been there. I should point out, um, I would love to go. I even planned on going last time I was in India, but it just didn't work.
Okay. Um, but yeah, my, my places tend to be real, but I tend to invent uh, aspects of them. I think that's a, the, the best way of putting it. Just another uh, fun, fun question. Um, I was thinking about um, the fun loving crime, crime writers, and I thought I'd ask you what, what song would you sing with them if they asked you to? Oh my goodness me, that's a good question. I've got so many. I think it would have to be something, um, it's got to be something crime related. So I'm going to go for Murder Mystery by Scouting for Girls. Have you heard that? Um, I've heard of it, yes. But, uh, well, yeah. that's what I would choose because I think it's topical. Uh, and it, and it's, um, it's a wee bit younger than most of the stuff that they do, so they've probably never heard of it. Um, but it's got a lot of um, it's got a lot of references to uh, you know detectives, shall we say? Hercule Poirot's in there. Uh, even the dog from Due South is mentioned in that song. So I'll go for Murder Mystery by Scouting for Girls. Mm -hmm. um, I was just thinking about Agatha Christie because you mentioned that that was a influence on Murder in the East. Um, why, why, why were you so fascinated by lock rooms? Um, I just think it is. Um, I think quite a few crime writers are. I think Agatha Christie. I'm a huge fan of. There was so much that she did for the genre, and she might not have been the first to do some of these, but in other ways she was. I mean, the idea that everybody might be guilty uh, of a crime, or you know, the the, the killer lurks amongst the suspect, uh, amongst the victims. Um, I mean, there was so much that she did well for the first time uh, that you have to, and, and the locked room was one of those. And just the mental puzzle of coming up with a, a way that hasn't been done before, um, I think is a great exercise. And I think a lot of authors do this. A lot of my favorite authors have had a go at the locked room mystery. So I'm a huge fan of Philip Kerr. Um, and he had a go at the locked room mystery. Martin Cruz Smith uh, did one in a book called Wolves Eat Dogs. Uh, in the Arkady Renko series, so it was. So for me, it was a wee bit of a challenge. Really, I wanted to, I wanted to show that this was me, as a crime writer, sort of living up to the sort of things that I'd seen other people do. And I thought, yes, if I can do this, it ticks a wee box for me in terms of yes, I, I can call myself a crime writer because I've written a locked room mystery. Um, and you know, it, it took a while, but I think, I think there's something. There's, this is a way that I've never seen done before. And I would hope your readers haven't um, seen it done before this way. There's another question. Sorry, carry on. So I do with that question and I'll come, out, come back with, uh, yeah. Sure. Um, somebody's asked, how accurate is your opium addiction cure at the ashram? Um, it is accurate. Um, it, uh, it's not, I've seen it, I read it in a book uh, called Opium Fiend by a guy called Stephen Wright who was, is an American guy, uh, and he, was, he started off as a collector of um, opium memorabilia, so pipes and all the stuff that goes around it. And then he thought, you know what, I'm going to try opium. <laughs> and he did, and over time he became hooked. And in the end, he ended up in a, in a Buddhist ashram in Thailand uh, where the cure was vomiting. It was drinking this this uh, portion and effectively vomiting your guts out for a week. Um, and so the, the cure is, uh, I believe, accurate. Um, you know, I've, I've moved it to, to India and I've moved it from a Buddhist ashram to a Hindu ashram, but that's the length of my imagination. The rest is all true, I think. Um, but there you are. Are there any other popular tropes that are in the genre that you might want to cover later? Oh, give me an idea. Give me some ideas because I need them. Yeah. I'm thinking of like um, uh, serial killers because obviously you've, you've not done that yet. I've not done a proper serial killer. I've done um, a, serial, a, a man who we thought was a serial killer but wasn't. It was just somebody out for revenge. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know. I, again, as I say, I'd need to have an angle on it. I'd have to have an angle that I can bring something new to. Um, if I can't, if I can't bring something new to it, then there's no point in me writing it. Um, so I'd have to see if, if something comes up. Then yeah, if I can think of a of a spin on a serial killer um, where the, maybe he's politically correct, I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to see. But um, if I can think of a spin on something or or an angle that I think needs to be covered, 
I'd love to do it. Um, so, but as as of yet, I haven't come up with that for for the series. But we'll I'm see. Just, if but keep the ideas coming, though, Alex, because I'll, I'll yeah. definitely think about them. I've just had an idea um, given to us. Um, trains, because obviously, trains in India do go yeah. together. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, I've got trains in the books, but nothing nothing set on a train yet, and that would be a very good one. And you know why? Because there was this film, I, you're again far too young. Um, there was a film out in the 50s or 60s. I'm, I'm too young for this, but I've seen it called Bowani Junction. I don't know if you've seen that. No. Uh, and it starred Stuart Granger and Ava Gardner, and it's set in India. And Ava Gardner was the, and when I think of Annie Grant in the books, I, I imagine Ava Gardner. I imagine she looks like Ava Gardner in Bowani Junction. Um, which I think started off as a book. It was a book written by a man called C.J. Masters, I think. Um, but yeah, I'd love to do one set on a train. I think you have to. I mean, with India, you have to have a book set on a train at some point. That's a really good idea. Um, I just need to think of something now. Um, thanks, Alex. I've, you've, you've, set, you've, got, you've got my work out for me now. Yeah. Um, thanks, uh, much, um, yeah, I for... talk too much. I've been told to yeah cut them off. No, right? no, 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 it's it's it's. If anyone's got any other questions, but yeah, yeah, I'm still here. But thank you so much, Alex, and thank you to your your viewers. Um, it, it's an absolute honour to be on, and and I hope for those of you who haven't had a chance to read the books, I hope you do get a chance. And Alex, all the best for the rest of the festival. I think it's amazing what you're doing. Um, you. We all need things like this at this difficult time, and you're you're providing. You know, some you're providing some joy to people, and that's brilliant. Thank you so much, and thanks so much for helping us out on Red Hot Chili Writers and having me on. Oh, not, not at all, not at all. I just hope that you know we get the widest audience we can for you. I just hope that, um, that the next time I'm asked about um, Ramadan, I can come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I couldn't either. I'm. I'm no, I think there's me and Amit who aren't Muslims on that. So Vasim's a Muslim. He's not a very good Muslim, to be fair. <laughs> He's a Muslim. Um, uh, Aisha is, as is Imran and uh, Alex, but me and Amit. But you, you and I, yeah, we, 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 we were in a minority that week, shall we say. Uh, yes, we did a, a Ramadan special, um, which... I would like to find out more about, to be honest with you, but um, they, they didn't really, we didn't really, I think we only scratched the surface in what we talked about. Yeah. All I can remember is just laughing about it when you asked me, because they're just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you didn't come prepared, Alex, so what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was our wee joke. Thank you so much. No, thank you, <laughs> thanks a lot. And I think, well, end it there. Thank you. Thank you.